Shalom, first and foremost, giving all the praise, honor, and glory unto Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Rachak, Wadash, double honors to the apostles, the elders of Great Millstone, peace and blessings to Hopeful Mech. Yeah, I just wanted to do a video because uh, this week at camp we had an individual who uh, said that uh, Muhammad never touched, you know, the Israelites. So I just want to bring out the uh, historical facts on that. That you know, Muhammad did touch the um, touch us. He did touch the Israelites, and also uh, when you watch the uh, live stream, uh, he said a little bit before how uh, he doesn't agree with how um, you know us seeking vengeance, basically, because we were telling him that you know the so-called uh, right race, which is known as Esau Edom, their biblical names. Uh, we were telling him that how you know. We were gonna uh, the Israelites. It's written in the scriptures that the Israelites would get recompense uh, for that. That they would have uh, the Esau Edom's gonna have to pay for the things that they did. And he was just throwing out the whole thing like you know that's not right. Basically, essentially what he's saying if you uh, watch him. But I'm just gonna go to the part where we speak about Muhammad. But when you watch, he basically said he doesn't think that's right and that doesn't you know make anything better and things like that. And it's like. You know, what people don't realize, people don't know the nature of the Heavenly Father, Yahweh Bashem Al Shai, that see when people hear vengeance, they think of a, think about it as like, Oh my god, that's such an evil thing. But the Heavenly Father speaks about vengeance. He says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will repay. So the Heavenly Father is with vengeance. He's okay with revenge. It's just people don't understand that you have to do there's a righteous way of uh, a righteous re, uh, revenge or righteous recompense. See, p when people hear vengeance or whatever, they think of it as an evil thing. But it's not evil if it's done in righteousness. And that's the thing that people don't uh, understand. If you do it ac uh, according to your own ways and things like that, according to your own mind, then that's off. You have to go according to what the Heavenly Father wants. That's why it says, uh, I believe that's in Zephaniah. He says, wait ye upon me till I rise up to the prey. The Heavenly Father wants us to wait on him. He wants us to um, He wants to get his revenge. And then he'll, uh, you know, let us get our revenge. It starts with him first. So there is such a thing as a righteous revenge. But people look at revenge as wickedness or, or vengeance as wickedness. But no, there is such a thing as a uh, righteous revenge. It has to be done in righteousness. But that's what things people don't understand. So uh, the main point of this video just wants to get how he was saying um, basically how... Uh, Muhammad never, uh, when he spread Islam, he never, you know, went to war with nobody. He was only, you'll hear him say it himself, um, that how Muhammad only, uh, only defended himself. But, you know, I have information here that says otherwise, you know. And when you listen to him, you'll kind of see that when we bring out the information that Muhammad did touch, uh, touch the Israelites and how he uh, to spread Islam, you could kind of see at that point he was kind of dodging the question. He was just, you know, he didn't really want to talk about it. And he didn't have much, you know, information to, you know, stand on those words to say, like, no, Muhammad never did that. But it's historical fact. And you're going to see, uh, I'll bring out that historical history as well. So I'll let the video play for a little while so you can hear. And then we'll get into the information. Tell you to kill people and Let burn their you. cities. Now you know Muhammad, right? Yeah, you know, beautiful. Lost you know what Muhammad did? How he conquered the lands that he conquered? Was it by peaceable words? Do you know Muhammad authorized it. rape and murder? Well, he did. Look it up. And he said, "Only mm -hmm. you're allowed to use violence only uh -huh. to defend yourself if you get attacked by someone." Or you know, during the, the the time of Muhammad, during the 600s, you know who were the attackers? You know who the, who were the attackers? The attackers, the Muslims. They were the attackers, because they were on a conquest to conquer all these different areas. And you know what they were doing? They were doing the same things the Lord told us to do. What do you mean? What did you say? No, 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 no. Muhammad. Is, is, he, is he perfect? Is he perfect? So he went and killed people and authorized. And I don't know if you could hear, it, but uh, he said that uh, when the brother asked him if Muhammad was perfect, he said yes. There is none perfect but the heavenly Father. Even Yahweh Shai said that, and Yahweh Shai was perfect. But even he gave credit to his father that uh, only the heavenly Father was perfect. Muhammad was not the prophet of Israelites, man.
There's only one perfect, and Yahweh Shai said that in heaven. Muhammad was just a man, not even an Israelite. As brief as conquering and spreading Islam, that is historical fact. Is that a good example? Look it up. Look it up. Look up. Look up how Islam came about in the world during Muhammad's time and see what they did. Now, like I said earlier, when we started saying that, you know, look it up and things like that, that's when he came. To me, he became very uh, more defensive, obviously because he's trying to defend his religion, but he became very more defensive, meaning like he just didn't believe that Muhammad could have done things like that. But it's like if you're going to know about, you know, if you're going to talk about uh, Islam, you got to know about your man. You're saying that Muhammad is the last prophet, the last greatest prophet. He's perfect. You got about you got to know about your man's. You got to know about uh, your boy. You can't just sit there and say he's perfect and this and that. And then when it comes out that uh, no, he he did some uh, evil things to people. And when we bring it out, you want to sit there and say, oh no no, he never did that. He only uh, Islam only pushes how you are to defend yourself. Well, when we get into the history, he did not use uh, he um, he didn't defend himself. He pushed his belief. On, uh, on Israelites, which really, when we get into it, his belief, well, he really copied our, uh, our, 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 a lot of our customs, but he just twisted it and made it into his thing. And in order, at any time, any empire with the Babylonians, well, before Babylonians, you had the um, Assyrian Babylonian Empire, or you could call it the, uh, the Neo-Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, especially with the Greeks and the Romans, you had something called uh, Hellenization, which is what? To conform people to your ways, to your religion, your uh, customs, your, uh, your type of uh, philosophies, your type of ways of living, your thought process. That's what every nation has always done. The, again, the, uh, the uh, Neo-Assyrian Empire did that. The Babylon, uh, uh, you could read about that with, um, um, I just read it the other day, with uh, Hezekiah. When uh, Sennacherib sent, uh, I believe it was, um, ah, what's his name? Forgot the name, but he sent his messengers over to uh, King Hezekiah. And basically, uh, the messenger was trying to turn over the people, saying, don't believe in Hezekiah when he says that the Lord will deliver you. Um, he was trying to persuade the people, come, I'll give you a land with uh, corn and wine like your own. I forgot what the messenger's name was. But basically, he's trying to sway the people into living like uh, Assyrians. And the same thing with uh, Nebuchadnezzar the second. When you read about that in Daniel the first chapter, Nebuchadnezzar wanted the best of the uh, of the best of the Israelites to conform them to his religion. You can read about that in Daniel the first chapter. So anytime you come into power, excuse me, especially with um, uh, the best example again was with the Greeks, with uh, well it really started off with uh, Alexander's father, King Philip. And then Alexander followed in the in the uh, in the role of his father. That um, they want to spread a Greek, um, spread uh, spread the Greek culture throughout the whole world because they thought that they wanted to be saviors and they thought that the world needed Greek. So anytime a civil uh, people come in, um, into power, they spread their uh, their customs, their ways, their philosophies, their laws, their religion upon the people, and they do it by violence, by force, because people if there's a uh, hard-headed in their, um, or maybe I should say hard-headed, but adamant in their beliefs, they're not going to change. So how do you change people into your beliefs? You got to do it by force. You got to kill some of them so that way some of them will see, okay, you know what? I don't want to die, so let me just, let me just conform to the, uh, their ways. N another example is with, um, during the um, time of the Greeks, is Antiochus Epiphanes. You can read about that in um, First Maccabees. So no, when uh, Islam was starting to come out and Muhammad was around, he did it by uh, he did it by force. He forced our people into believing into Islam. And how did he do that? You're gonna uh, we're gonna read about it later. Did it by the sword. But I'll let a little bit more play, and then we'll get into our history. Cause I know I keep saying that. Look up what he did and how he conquered the other lands. He didn't go and talk to them. Oh, he don't, he don't want to be on camera. He didn't talk to them. It was war. That's how he conquered these lands and spread Islam, through conquest, which was war, where he actually killed people. We have 
start we start having issues we started having issues after his death but before his death because after his death like i said humans are not perfect there is greed there is uh, they wanted they wanted to have power people so we start having opinions different opinions after his death for the vibe what he did when he was alive i want you to address that part when he killed people I don't have enough knowledge to speak about it. I'm telling you the history. And it, and it, it is a big weakness that I learned. Unfortunately, but you're saying... Unfortunately, I have my friends here who have... But, but you know what? Your friend, based on the narrative you made, it would be hard for him to defend the point because you mentioned violence can only be used to... Def it's only justified to defend yourself. Exactly. Muhammad didn't use violence to defend himself because he was the attacker. He was a conqueror. The brother's gonna pull it up in history right now. How did that pull up in the Bible? No, history. It's Research. History. The internet. Oh. Did you not get information off the internet? Have you never got information off the internet? Have I've you read books? Oh, really? So, what resources should we choose to find out about the history of Muhammad? Alright. Now let's get into it. So this is from the uh, the book from Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf R. Windsor, right? And this says the birth of Islam. Now I'm not going to read every single thing. I'm just going to read certain paragraphs. But let's find out a little bit about Muhammad, who he is, and things like that. And then let's get into his uh, his conquest. Since let's let's see if it's true that uh, Muhammad didn't touch nobody, that he wasn't a conqueror. So it says, as you can see right there, the birth of Islam. <clears throat> At the time of the birth of Muhammad, uh, what were the international events or conditions operating? The answer to this question is necessary for a comprehension of the rapid emergence of the Mohammedan Empire. The Roman Empire at the birth of Muhammad was divided into two parts, the Western Empire with the capital at Rome and the Byzantine Empire with the capital at, Const at Constantinople. The Roman Empire in the West collapsed uh, AD 476 after many barbarian raids and incursions the Germanic tribes crossed the border and penetrated into all the territory of the Western Empire including Africa the Eastern Empire was deprived of its vigor by repeated wars with per uh, Parthia which is Persia this empire could not hold its possession with a firm grip the constant uh, the constant impos imposition of heavy taxes a scarcity of soldiers and agricultural laborers, economic exhaustion, and, and a, a large slave class and influx of the barbarians with frequent wars brought disorder and weakened both, both the Western and Eastern empires. With, with the defeat of Jewish and Christian, with the defeat of Jewish and Christian power in Arabia, the stage was now set for the rise of a new power, new power on the world scene. This new power was Arabia. The Arabian Empire, oops, sorry, with its new religion, Islam, established the superstructure of its culture on the ruins of the Roman Empire in the, in the Middle East, Africa, and parts of Europe. Europe remained dormant and inactive for a thousand years through the Dark Ages. That's when we was uh, in rulership. Uh, while the Muslim Empire mastered the civil, uh, civilized progressive world, let us, let us return now to survey the rise of the Muslim religion and empire in Arabia. When Muhammad was born, many Arabs were still worshipping the sun, stars, spirits, and idols. The Arabs possessed 360 idols, one for each year. Wow. Muhammad was born A.D. 570, 400 years after the death of Emperor Justinian. He was, de he was descended from the tribe of Korish and and the family of Hashem his mentality was prodigious in his youth he was never taught to read or write so hold on that's another thing here it is you have he's one of the greatest prophets the last prophet but yet he doesn't know how to read and write what kind of prophet is that how you don't know how to read and write the prophets they knew how to read uh, the prophets of Israel they knew how to read and write because they had to write down the visions that they had so that way we can have it here today. What kind of prophet is this that doesn't know how to read and write? 
You mean to tell me the Lord is going to deal with a prophet that doesn't know how to read or write? But Muhammad was, and then again, the individual that came to camp said that Muhammad was perfect. If Muhammad was perfect, how does he not know how to read and write? Uh, his, uh, he was never taught to read or write, but his imagination was super lack, uh, super lack, lactative, lactive. I uh, hope I'm saying that word right. Muhammad was an extraordinarily, extraordinarily handsome man and eloquent in motivating men with, with the power of words. In the early years of Muhammad's life, he passed his time as a shepherd boy. We must remember that many successful men have arisen from insignificant and humble conditions watching the sun day watching the sun by day and the stars by night left opportunity for Muhammad to contemplate in solitude and reflect on on the events and profundities of the world actually hold on. let me see I want to get uh, more to the point well not more to the point but I just don't want to read every single thing actually yeah we'll keep going hold on Oh, it's lucky. Give me one second. Actually, yeah, we'll just keep going. After Muhammad became a camel driver, he traveled to remote and intriguing lands. He led his caravans to Persia, Syria, Egypt, tra transacting business with merchants of every kind. On his business trip, he met Jews, Christians, and members of other sects. He interrogated them concerning the tenets of their religion. He frequented the environment of the Jews and their rabbis, mostly because they were merchants and an omnipresent ethnic group. Excuse me. Because he could not read or write, his ears were attentive and keen to everything that the Jews related to him. Muhammad learned and extracted much from the Jewish religion and compounded it with his new religion, Islam. So he just copied our stuff and just switched it around and just uh, said, hey, this is a new religion. I'm just going to take what the Israelites believe in and just switch out, switch around certain things and say that go from Yahweh, Bashem Al Shai to Allah and things like that. This man was a copycat, man. Not for, I'm not going to deal with him and meeting Khadijah or whatever. That was his wife that he met. I'm not going to deal with that. But we're going to get to this point now. It says the first stage of the Islamic revolution. So let's just go back a little bit with dealing with Muhammad. So Muhammad was just a prophet, uh, supposedly a prophet that couldn't read or write, but, you know, he was perfect. A perfect man that can't read or write. That That's some type of prophet right there. That's some type of logic. He was this perfect prophet that couldn't read or write, but yet took, uh, so -called, took the religion of other people and took it for his own and then created a new religion. Where did you know, just this this BS of these other religions and the, the bullshit of this world, you know, is just gonna it's gonna come to an end because this this doesn't make any sense. How is he a prophet of the Lord, but yet, you know, he can't read or write? What kind of prophet is that? Then on top of that, he uh I, I may have skipped over it, or we might read it here. It said how the angel Gabriel came to uh, um, to Muhammad and revealed things unto him. But it's like, hold on, you mean to tell me if the angel Gabriel came to him? The angel Gabriel didn't came, uh, come to Muhammad on his own on his own free will. That angel would have to have gotten orders to come to Muhammad. But I believe the uh, the angel Gabriel was the same angel that came to Daniel and gave him his visions, which when you read about it in Daniel, the second chapter and seventh chapter, about how the fall of the kingdoms, you know, Daniel chapter two, it goes into a statue. Daniel chapter seven goes into the uh, different type of beasts. So the angel Gabriel, if I'm not mistaken, was the angel that came to Daniel and gave him the visions. That's the one that Yahweh, Bashem Yahushai, sent to Daniel. But you mean to tell me that the Heavenly Father sent Gabriel to give this guy uh, visions, Muhammad, to create a new religion? Doesn't that, isn't that bring confusion? But the scriptures say that the Heavenly Father is not the author of confusion. So on one hand, with one prophet, you give him the, you know, basically the, you know, the structure of how the, uh, the king, the empires, the kingdoms are going to fall. 
but then this other prophet, you're giving him whatever visions you have to what? Start a new religion? That doesn't make any sense. But continuing on, it says the first stage of the Islamic revolution. Matter of fact, let me look up that word revolution real quick. See what that says. Okay, so this is what it says for revolution. First definition, right? It says a forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. And that's exactly what Muhammad brought. It says an overthrow. Anarchy. Some of these words for, um, um, some of these uh, synonyms for the uh, definition. It says overthrow. Seizure, seize siege in power anarchy sedition regime change says insurrection let me see if the etymology one second has anything more Yeah, the etymology just says the same thing. It says overthrow of an established political or social system. And that's what he came and did. He basically overthrew our beliefs and said, you know, follow, follow my ways. These are the new ways that you're going to follow. If you didn't do it, as it says, when we, uh, as I'm going to read, it says he became a martial prophet. He has now become a, a prophet of the sword. But yeah. All right, let's continue. So it says, according to Alvin, Alvin, Alvin L. Bertrand, most mass movements pass through four stages or phases to complete a whole cycle. But Eric Hoffer, the Long's Shoreman, postulates three stages, vocal stage, fanatical stage, and the stage of practical men of action. Muhammad spent many days in the hills outside of, of Mecca. He was immersed deeply in the deplorable condition of his people and he wanted to lead them away from moral turpitude and idolatry. It seemed to him that the angel Gabriel appeared commissioning him to artic articulate a new religion to sub substitute for the old. So again, yes, that was what I was getting into earlier. So basically the angel Gabriel, the same one, if I'm not mistaken, came to Daniel and gave him his visions, came to uh, Muhammad to now start up a new religion. But the Heavenly Father is only with his law, statutes, and commandments that he made. The Heavenly Father is not with Islam. He didn't give the Islamites Islam. So what the hell is that about where, because basically, like I said earlier, that angel is not going to come and do his own thing. That angel had to have gotten orders. So you mean to tell me that the Heavenly Father sent Gabriel to speak to this prophet, again, the one that can't read or write, but yet it's perfect, to go push Islam? That don't make no damn sense. When, he, when that same angel was given the visions to Daniel and how at the end when you uh, go into it at the, um, at the last days how um, as it says in um, I believe it's the 17th verse of uh, Daniel 7 and 7 how it says that the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom and what do you think we're going to do when we take the kingdom we're going to push our laws and our, uh, our statutes and commandments as it says in as a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah the second chapter but you mean to tell me that the heavenly father sent Gabriel to go tell this man to go push Islam Oh, fucking people. Uh, okay, yeah, so yeah. Incidentally, Gabriel was the same angel who appeared in the vision to the Hebrew prophet Daniel. Right, okay. Muhammad gradually came to believe that he was a prophet and expounded his religion to, uh, expounded his religion to members of his family. He went out to the holy temple to preach to the multitudes that gathered to worship idols. With these words, well, actually, we're gonna, I'm going to skip that because it comes up later on. But basically, that's the, uh, well, it'll come up later. Uh, 
Actually, I'm going to skip a little. Hold on, let me see. Matter of fact, I'll continue a little bit here. It says, In incidentally, by this time, the Hebrew Old Testament had been translated into Arabic and the Arabs were rapturously pleased to read about their great ancestor in the story of the Hebrew patriarchs. This fact alone helped Muhammad to inspire the Arabs, the feeling of nationalism and, uh, and racial pride because they had read in the Hebrew scriptures that Ishmael was to become a great nation. Muhammad masterminded the first stage of his revolution by undermining and discrediting prevailing established beliefs and customs and questioning other political, social, and religious institutions. Muhammad attacked the merchants and rulers in Mecca who employed, uh, who employed the well of Ishmael and the Kaaba uh, temple for monetary gain. Not only did he speak out against idolatry, but also against gambling and drunkenness because he spoke against the wine and enterprises of the city of Taf. Uh, Taf. Muhammad was compelled to leave the city. When Muhammad returned to the city of Mecca, the opposition was intensified against him. A law was enacted that anybody who accepted Islam would be exiled. When the leaders of the city of Mecca were informed that Muhammad was uh, gaining converts, in Yathrib, they conspired to assassinate him. This conspiracy mo uh, motivated Muhammad to flee from Mecca to Yathrib the night of Muhammad's flight to Yathrib, later called Medina. The city of the prophets is known as the Higara, the flight. Oh, we're going to get to this. Okay, yeah, this part now. Don't want to read every single thing because not everything is in there. And I'm just going because I have the book as well. And I'm just reading the highlighted parts, the more important parts. But we're going to get to that most important part with the whole uh, did he touch people or not. But it says Islam and Judaism, right? It says the Prophet Muhammad adopted many principles and laws from the Jewish religion. First of all, the basic idea of monothe monotheism which is the belief in one God, which, again, if the angel Gabriel came to him and established this, for what? First of all, the Heavenly Father is the God of the Israelites. He's not the God of you so-called Ishmaelites, man. Now, when you go into that name Ishmael, Ishmael in the Hebrew is Yashemai Allah, meaning he has heard of the power or he has heard of God. But that doesn't mean that, you know, God hears you and he's dealing with you. The Heavenly Father is only the God of the Israelites. When it says that, when uh, the Heavenly Father went to Abraham, I mean, sorry, to Moses, he said, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he even says sometimes the God of Jacob or the God of the Israelites. So now all of a sudden you mean to tell me the Heavenly Father is now the God of Ishmael? What the hell is that? That's bringing confusion, man. That's what these other religions bring, man. This is why these other religions have to be torn down. That's why when, uh, like I made the point earlier, when the saints shall take the kingdom, this is and uh, and fulfill um, Isaiah the second chapter when Yahweh Shai comes back and we uh, set up the kingdom. This is why uh, we're gonna have to uh, do what you guys did to us, but it's gonna be in righteousness. The same way you guys tore us down and uh, want to kill us and murder us and beat us into believing in your things, well, that role reversal is gonna happen now to where what we're gonna do that same thing to you when Lord's when we get the victory over the beast and over the uh, and over his mark. We're gonna institute our laws. We're going to institute the law, such commandments of Yahweh Bashem Yashah upon the earth. And we're going to have that rod of iron in our hand. If you don't uh, listen to what we got to say, we're going to beat your ass. Because it's the same thing that you did to us. And it's going to be in righteousness. Not out of wickedness out of man, but it's going to be done in righteousness. And that's uh, something that people don't understand. You can do things in righteousness so long as you follow the law, statutes, and the ways of the Heavenly Father, Yahweh Bashem Yashah. There is a righteous way of doing things. It's not about good and bad. It's about being righteous. And that's what people don't understand. Like the scriptures say, I believe that's Isaiah. He says, uh, matter of fact, let me just get it real quick. Because when people hear about bloodshed and violence and all that, people get all, oh, my God, no, we can't do these things. But no, nah, you can do it. It has to be in righteousness, though. 
Our righteousness comes from the Heavenly Father. Now I get a precept for that. We're not just doing this just because we want to do this. This is Isaiah 54 and 17. It reads, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage. Okay, okay the heritage. Matter of fact, let me look up that word heritage. See what that says. <laughs> Says possession, propriety, or property, I'm sorry, heritage. This is our portion. Let me see what else. To inherit. Yeah, it just says in multiple, same thing. But it's, I'll read it again. It says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So our righteousness is not of us, because our righteousness is, is as filthy rags. Our righteousness is of the Heavenly Father. So continue. It says, The Prophet Muhammad adopted many principles and laws from Jewish religion. First of all, the basic idea of monotheism, which is the belief in one God. The Jewish confession of the unity of God is, well, it says, um, that's the Shema, uh, Shema Yasharala. Yahweh Allah Hayanawa, Yahweh Achad, that's, you know, here, O Israel, Yahweh is one power, Yahweh, uh, Yahweh is one. I mean, there is only one God, Yahweh is the only God. Yeah, it's, it translates to English, uh, here, O Israel, the Lord, our power, the Lord is one. But then he basically copied that and made his own twist on it. And basically, the Mohammedan, the Mohammedan slogan is as follows. I'm not going to read that, but you can read it for yourself. But it's basically copying the same thing. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. So again, copying a lot of our stuff, man. Muhammad adopted also the main details of the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement, the Sabbath, and much of the Bible and narratives from the Midrash and many uh, points of the ritual law. Incidentally, the, Jewish, the Jews pray three times a day uh, facing the city of Jerusalem and the Muslims, true believers, pray five times a day facing the city of Mecca. Trying his best, Muhammad sought to convert the Jews to his new religion, but to no avail. The Jews were adamant, to, uh, adamant and resistant to change. The high esteem which the prophet held for the Jews was transformed to enmity, and instead of allies, he looked upon them as competitors. Muhammad needed the uh, confirmation of, of the influential Jews to validate his mission, as all upstarts needed their as all upstarts needed the backing of someone influential. Muhammad therefore turned against the Jews and became their tormentor. So let's read about that since he became our tormentor. I'm just going to skip that part. Right? And this is the final part right here. The main part. Because the individual again said that Muhammad didn't do these things, right? And he said that you only uh, attack people to defend yourself. Like the brother said in the video, Muhammad didn't do that. He was the attacker. He was the aggressor. And let's read about that now. So lucky for this video being too long. Just want to get into who Muhammad is. If we're going to learn about this guy, if he's this, such this great prophet, let's learn about him. Let's see if he is this, such this great prophet. Okay. So it says the second stage of the Islamic revolution, right? It says the fanatical stage of most revolutions is bestial, ruthless, bloody, chaotic affair. The throats of men are cut from ear to ear. There is an absence of rationalization and extreme fanaticism sets in. So, so, was it, so it was with Muhammad. He had come to a point of no return. He became a religious extremist in order to give his people a better life on a rapid scale. Muhammad came to the conclusion that all means of persuasion had been exhausted. The period of patience was past, and he was now determined to propagate his religion by the sword. He, for he said, I, the la last of the prophets, am sent with a sword. The sword is the key to heaven and hell. All who draw near it in the name of faith will be rewarded. Muhammad became a martial prophet, and martial means war. 
you can uh you can look that word up marshall says uh where was a uh, marshall prophet and the pagans and the stubborn jews became his victims in the year 627 the battle of of the foss occurred <clears throat> the jewish tribes were defeated by arm by the, by the armies of muhammad several 700 jews were gathered in the marketplace and offered the alternative the quran or the sword which basically means the quran or death but but, but the devout jews were accustomed to martyrdom they did not hesitate in their choice muhammad carried out his bestial threat executed the jews and the women were sold so there you go muhammad right there yeah that's all right Oh no, hold on. So I can hold. Yeah, but there you go. So Muhammad, in order to convert to Islam, Muhammad didn't do the whole like you believe in his religion, you only uh, d uh defend yourself. No, he became the attacker. He was the aggressor in order to push Islam on, on our people. So we were touched, man, and we're gonna get the recompense because, like I said a little early in the video, how he doesn't believe in us getting, you know, basically recompense because he just sees that as becoming a cycle of things happening over and over. But you see, no, 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 that's not going to happen. You see, after this, after Esau Edom goes down, that's it. There is no cycle of man going to continue doing this. We're going to set up the law, statutes, and commandments of the Heavenly Father on earth, and, it, and the earth is going to be in righteousness. Again, that key word, righteousness, that people don't seem to understand. The world right now believes in the good and the bad. No, this is about righteousness. Yahweh Shai told uh, the uh, the apostles uh, worry not for what you need to eat and things like that. Roughly paraphrasing, seek ye the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Again, it's about seeking righteousness of the heavenly Father, not about good and bad and all that bullshit. We're gonna get a precept because you see, we were touched. Uh, we were uh, we have been touched, man, and we're gonna get our recompense, which means to uh, pay back. Re meaning back and compens. Uh, uh, comp uh, compensate goes to work uh, 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 goes into the word compensate meaning to pay back and how are you going to pay back these uh, so called blacks, Latinos and Native Americans that have been raped, robbed and murdered well you're going to have to uh, this gonna, same thing that's going to ha have to happen to your people man you're going to have to uh, Esau is going to have to give back the riches and everything that he sold So we're going to get a couple of precepts because we're going to go according to what the scriptures say. And I pray in the Lord's will in this video has been edifying. This is Amos 9 and 13. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Now, who's the plowman? The plowman is the man that, uh, you know, is the worker, the man that works in the field. Matter of fact, let me see if it says anything on that. doesn't say anything. Hold on, let me see if I can find anything here. Oh, right, plowman says a person uses a plow. So basically the worker, right? It says uh, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes. Uh, the reapers, uh, the, uh, the Edomites, they're the one that reap the benefits off of our labor. So behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the threader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. So right, the heavenly, the days gonna come when the heavenly fire um, switches it to where what, the plowman's gonna overtake the reaper, and what the plowman's not gonna become the reaper, and the reaper's not gonna become the plowman. Meaning that what in the kingdom of heaven, Esau is gonna be the plowman, and we're gonna be uh, the reaper. He's gonna be building up our kingdom. This is Daniel chapter 9 and 12, if I'm not mistaken. I'll start at 11. Not for, uh, I'll start at 10. This is Daniel chapter 9, verse 10. This is a prayer, a supplication that Daniel, Daniel the prophet that can also read and write, that uh, was given to the Heavenly Father. It says, Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord, our power to walk in his ways, 
which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Right, because we got sold into slavery by the, uh, by the Babylonians, uh, 586 B.C., when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem. Yea, all of Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not, uh, that they might, that they might not obey the, obey thy voice. Therefore, the curses poured upon us that you, and in, in the curses in Deuteronomy, the uh, the curses poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of the heavenly Father, because we have sinned against him, and he had confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil for under for under the whole heaven has had not been done as had been done upon jerusalem right so we have been the people that's always been afflicted man we have been the people that's always been attacked now obviously it's because the heavenly father sets it up because of our wickedness but we're the ones that's always getting attacked and now when it's time for our recompense and i, I you know i believe the brother uh, has always brought this up well when he he relates this to esau now when it's time for us to get our recompense, you see, when, when it comes to you other nations, when you want your recompense, you're very quick to sit there and you want to go to war with people and things like that. You're ready to, you know, fight. But now when it's time for us so-called blacks, Latinos, and Native American Indians, for us to get our recompense, for us to get our judgment, no, 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 you can't do things this way. No, uh, this is going to be wrong. You want to know why you don't want that? Because you're scared. Because in your spirit, even though you don't, may not know it or understand it, you know that when we... Uh, when we come into power, when we uh, come back to the Heavenly Father, Yahweh Bashem Hashem, we're going to beat your fucking ass and we're going to put our foots on your necks. And y'all know that shit. That's why y'all are afraid of us. And y'all don't want um, us to rule over y'all. Like when you read the book of Lamentations, it talks about uh, they, uh, all these nations look down upon us. They say, is this the perfection of beauty? They hiss and wag their tail at us. You look down upon us and you don't want us to uh, come and rule over you. But it's okay for you to rule over us? Nah. That's not right in the sight of the Heavenly Father. That's not righteous. Like the scriptures say, seeing it is, a, it is a just thing with the Heavenly Father to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. All you nations have, uh, have troubled us, man. And we're going to get our recompense. We're going to get our payback for that. And it's going to be righteous in the sight of the Heavenly Father, man. But uh, that's all I want to get. I just want to get the historical proof that Muhammad did touch us. And he uh, that guy was found out to be a liar. That Muhammad didn't just... Um, uh, you know, def uh, you know, he did attack her. He was the aggressor in order to push Islam. So, prayer that this video, uh, video is edifying. I want to give all the honor and glory unto Yahweh, Ba Hashem Yahweh Shai, Ba Hashem Rachak Madash, Shalom.